Good evening. Welcome to Sign Time. Dr. Hartle, please go ahead and get started. Thank you, Jessica. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to Spine Time. My name is Roger Hartle. I'm one of the co-directors of the Center for Comprehensive Spine Care here on the Upper East Side in Manhattan in New York. I'm a neurosurgeon at Weill Cornell and New York Presbyterian Ox Spine. And I'm happy tonight to welcome everybody again, once again, to one of our episodes of Spine Time, where we discuss hot and relevant topics related to your spine care. Today, we're gonna to talk about do's and don'ts after spine surgery, something that we hear about every day in clinic when we see patients, everybody has questions about what should they do or should they not do before or after spine surgery. And we'll, we'll try to address that with some of the experts here from the Spine Center. Before we introduce my co-host tonight, a few words about the Spine Center. Most of you are obviously familiar with this. We are located on 59th Street and 2nd Avenue on the Upper East Side in New York. We're part of Wild Cornell and New York Presbyterian Ox Spine. And the special feature about our Spine Center is really that we encompass multiple specialties of, speci of, of physicians who all deal with various aspects of spine care. Operative, we have neurosurgeons, we have orthopedic spine surgeons, part of the team, but we also have pain management, physiatry, PMNR or sports medicine is an important part of the spine center. We work very closely with psychologists, neuroradiologists to interpret imaging studies that we get and also with complementary medicine. So the idea is really to bring all these experts together to diagnose a problem, to decide what type of treatment and then guide you through the treatment process and eventually also, of course, recovery and rehabilitation. We've been doing this for a number of years and uh, as part of our post-COVID kind of recovery process, we decided to start these spine time webinars that have been very successful. And today it gives me special pleasure that we have the co-directors here, all the, co the three co-directors of the Spine Center, Dr. Ricky Singh, who you can see here, and Dr. Neil Mehta, friends and colleagues. We've been working together, taking care of many, many spine patients over the years. And who better than these individuals here to talk to us about the do's and don'ts after spine surgery. So Ricky, Neil, thanks for joining us. I also want to give a shout out to Dr. Galal El Sayed, who is a neurosurgeon who just joined us at Cornell and New York Presbyterian Ox Spine, primarily in Queens. Uh, but Dr. Galal is a specialist in mineral invasive and complex spine surgery. Welcome, Dr. Galal El Sayed. Thanks for joining us tonight. But let's go with Ricky and with Dr. Mehta. So what are your thoughts about do's and don'ts before, during, after spine surgery? Now, when we discussed this informally earlier, Dr. Singh talked about prehab, which is something that happens before surgery, but has very, very important implications, of course, what happens to, for what happens during and after spine surgery. So even though it's not after surgery, it happens before, but, but Ricky, Please explain, what, how does it affect things that happen after surgery, prehab? Sure. Thanks, Roger. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us at, uh, at uh, Spine Time. You know, when a lot of us think about physical therapy or rehab rehabilitation medicine, which is what I practice, we're thinking about identifying a problem and then trying to solve it afterwards. So, you know, you get hurt and you go see your doctor, you go to physical therapy. You know, you injure your back, you twist your ankle, you rehabilitate it. So this concept of prehabilitation is really thinking about optimizing your success after surgery by intervening beforehand. So getting your body ready and, and in a position to recover faster. And the ways to do that are to see one of us at the Spine Center and say, listen, you know, I'm about to have surgery with Dr. Hartle in four weeks. Let's give me the best chance to recover the fastest. And that's where we really work on your own body, your nutrition, your mobility, your strength posture and a whole bunch of different mechanics 
And I, I want to get this idea kind of out there because I don't want physical therapy and rehabilitation to be thought of as, a, as I've injured myself, now I need to recover. I really want us all to think about let's just always be habilitating uh, so that if we are in a position that we need surgery, we're in the best shape possible. So this is kind of a concept called prehabilitation, just preparing your body for living in today's society. This picture is kind of funny because it talks about how we were quadruped millions of years ago. Um, as uh, exactly uh, where that mouse is. And then we were biped and agriculturalists. And now we're back to sitting at a computer and worsening our posture again. So we really have to intervene to prevent that from, from getting worse. Yeah, so that's an interesting concept, uh, Ricky. And uh, if I think about prehab and preparation, I think about you know, pain sometimes. Now, patients are in pain, obviously, before surgery, which is sometimes an important reason why they have surgery in the first place. And recently, I think we've been getting better at recognizing that and also anticipating needs that patients may have after, during, after, you know, before, during, and after surgery in terms of their pain management. And, and, and maybe, Neil, you want, you want to say a few words about that? We just started a, an initiative in the Spine Center where we can send patients before surgery for a pain management uh, consultation. And then there's obviously the whole thing about ERAS and medication uh, management before surgery. Can you tell us about that a little bit? Yes, thank you, Roger, and thank you, Ricky. You know, much like the prehab concept for medication, similar concepts uh, apply. For the vast majority of patients going through surgery, most of the medications that will be used will be used during surgery and then afterwards. And we've gotten very good at identifying the drugs that work the best and creating very tight and specific protocols on how people use these medications, both during their stay in the hospital and when they go home. And we've also worked on trying to reduce harm by minimizing the number of days that people are on some of the higher strength medications like opioids or gabapentin or Lyrica or muscle relaxants. And the reason for that is uh, some of them do have side effects that we want to control and reduce exposure to. But there are also patients that have chronic pain going into surgery that the surgery will hopefully alleviate, but are on medications like opioids or other drugs that we should formulate a plan before they go into surgery. And having a consultation with the pain management specialist ahead of time kind of does two things. One is it alerts everybody to understand that this will be a little more uh, of an intricate plan and we lay it out and so everybody's on the same page. But the second thing is that there is some benefit in potentially tapering some of the medications, including and probably most importantly opioids, because then there might be a potential for more effect of those drugs that you were once tolerant to if, during the surgery period. So for example, if you start a few weeks before surgery to taper maybe by 20 to 25%, there's been some publications and experience that the overall pain improves in the uh, recovery period, because now the medications are a little bit more potent and, and can respond better. So strengthening the ability for those medicines ahead of time and using the best practices after surgery are what we really aim to achieve. Yeah, a few words about ERAS. There are all these other medications that, that patients get the day of the surgery, right? Yeah, ERAS is funny because, you know, now we're living in a Taylor Swift world and she's on the ERAS tour. I don't know, Roger, really? if you're familiar with that. But, uh, I have no idea. Uh, Ricky, may, Ricky may know it. Uh, but ERAS stands for Enhanced Recovery from Ambulatory Surgery. And it's not just specific to spine surgery. It's really any type of surgery where we took the best evidence of helping people get through surgery as best as possible. And that includes things like diet, nutrition fluids that are given during surgery, the types of anesthesia, nerve blocks, and then also the, the medications that are used. And uh, what we really aim to achieve, both by looking at experiences across the globe, 
but also here locally. How do our patients do with the, the types of treatment that we provide here at Wild Cornell? Um, try to create a, a more standard plan. And those things evolve year to year. For example, there was a time probably about 10 years ago when everybody got OxyContin. Uh, we were uh, giving everyone OxyContin at its lowest dose twice daily when they had a fusion operation. Now we realize that the vast majority of patients don't need that and, and uh, we know some of the concerns about OxyContin. So could we do better with oxycodone at a lower dose used as needed uh, for the first several days? So that ERAS protocol is uh, something that uh, we, we have seen um, really help patients in the vast majority. But as with any recipe or protocol, there's the ability to change and adapt to based on how you're doing. And that's part of the other second phase of ERAS is very close follow-up. So we have invested uh, as multiple departments in a number of people that will check on you each day during your hospital stay. And our physician assistants and nurse practitioners are very good about understanding what type of recovery you should have, when should you start moving, doing physical therapy, and if you're not able to do those things, what can we do to adjust the medications? Yeah, Neil, that, that may be a nice opportunity here to mention that for patients who end up having spine surgery with us at New York Presbyterian and Wild Cornell here, you know, we have a dedicated floor now to North, which is a dedicated floor for all spine patients who are having surgery and need to be admitted overnight. And that's exactly the the place where physical therapy is available every day for every patient, which is also something that we recently started and which helps us guide patients through the pro process of post-operative recovery. The same with pain management. We're working now on a um, system where every patient, regardless of what type of surgery, is going to be evaluated by a pain management specialist for the same reason, you know, to really guide them through a smooth post-operative course with minimal pain. So two north is something that we just started. We just opened the unit about a month or two months ago. We're very excited. We've got a dedicated team of nurses and they do nothing other than take care of patients with spine problems. So it's a big, it's a huge thing for us here at, at, at Wild Cornell and um, goes hand in hand with everything that Neil and uh, Dr. Singh also talked about. A few questions here. What about uh, vaccines uh, after or before surgery? Uh, there's a question, what's your position regarding having flu COVID, the new COVID or RC vaccine uh, before, before surgery or after surgery? And, any thoughts about that? Uh, you know, I, I'd argue that being vaccinated probably prevents chances of getting those particular infections, you know, not, less to do with a laminectomy surgery in itself, but, you know, being in a hospital, unfortunately there are risks of getting sick from other patients and uh, having yourself, you know, as strong as possible, including the right vaccinations is really key, especially as we come into flu season. Yeah. The question that comes up a lot for us is uh, not related to these injections, but the other injections we do for pain management and for function, epidural steroid injections and things like that. For you guys as surgeons, how do you view steroids um, in close proximity to a patient undergoing either a laminectomy or a fusion? Yeah, you know, I personally, I do a lot of minimal invasive surgery and I personally, I don't think that really it interferes with the post-operative course. There's theoretically, there's a little bit of a risk of if it causes adhesions maybe, which could increase the risk of tearing the dura during surgery, having a spinal fluid leak or a risk of infection after surgery. I think I think those are very, very minor, those risks. And, and I, I'm not really too worried about it because of how I do the surgery, uh, because these risks are so minimal in the first place. Uh, if somebody has open surgery where there is a higher risk of an infection, but sometimes patients need open surgery, of course, maybe it's a little bit of a bigger concern. Do Dr. El Sayed, what do you think? What do you tell your patients about having epidural injections before? And this happens if somebody has severe pain and the surgery is scheduled in two weeks. 
Can they have an epidural to kind of bridge that time period until the surgery? What, what, what do you tell your patients? Uh, yeah, Dr. Hartle, I, th I think the most important thing is to try and keep the patients as comfortable as possible. So an epidural steroid is fine from my perspective with my patients. Uh, I just let them know that uh, it's important that uh, they keep a very close form of communication with me, letting me know how uh, uh, well it's worked for them. So that helps guide my, my decompression to some degree too. That's a good point. So let's move on to, um, we talked about mobility, core training, cross training, prehab. Let's move to actually what happens after surgery. This is something that, that maybe some of you here who are listening tonight have seen before. This is kind of my general post-op activity slide that I show patients. And this may obviously change. This may be a little bit different from patient to patient. But let's say somebody has a lumbar decompression, a minimally invasive microdiscectomy or laminectomy. You know, a lot of these patients will go home the same day. As a matter of fact, you know, we're looking at our numbers every month in the, especially now with True North being opened. Our the, the proportion of patients that used to go home the same day, maybe five, 10 years ago, was minimal, was like 10, 15%. And just now, yesterday, we reviewed our numbers again. It's actually, it was 50%, meaning 50% of patients that we operated on over the last four weeks went home within 24 hours after surgery. I mean, just imagine that in spine surgery, right? That's, that's quite remarkable. And that tells you how good these protocols work, the prehab, the ERAS protocols and so forth, and the pain management. So half, pay, half of our patients actually go home the same day. For those patients then, once they go home, I tell them typically after lumbar decompression, even after lumbar fusion operation, I want them to walk the first two weeks. There's a lot of walking and mix it up with sitting and standing. I always tell patients no heavy lifting, no bending, no twisting for at least six weeks after surgery. So keep your back straight. And then two weeks after surgery, I let them go back to the gym and work, for example, on the elliptical because elliptical is great because you can keep your back straight, you can move your arms, move your legs, but you put you don't put as much really pressure on the lower back if you had lower back surgery. Swimming is okay with me after two weeks, as long as the incision looks fine, of course. Breaststroke is better than crawling because of the twisting. Recumbent bike is great. Again, the idea being keep your back straight, but get your body moving, burn some calories. That helps you with your overall recovery. And then six weeks after surgery, guided physical therapy. Any, any comments from you guys, Neil or Ricky? Yeah, you know, I think, you know, what we talked about, especially with uh, the work that we do together at, on, at Two North with the spine uh, acute care unit, I think it's all about early mobilization. And, you know, a lot of patients are worried, you know, the day of surgery, the week of surgery, can I move? And we tell patients, we want you to move right away. And the, the sooner you move, the better you're going to recover and certainly pain management is a big part of that. If the pain is better controlled, patients will move faster. Um, but the first two weeks, I think, are important just for patient education. We want you to move, but we want this to be protected movement. So no BLTs, no bending, lifting, twisting. Uh, but walking is great. Getting nutrients and blood and oxygen to some of these spine structures is going to help with your recovery. Uh, so from a rehab perspective, mobility is medicine. Um, but just want to do it safely so you prevent, don't wait, so you avoid re-injury. No, one of the obvious questions is always, if I if I can't do any bending, lifting, twisting, how am I going to pick up things? What, what, what do you guys tell your patients? I mean, that, that comes to the education, maybe the prehab meeting that you have with us or physical therapy before you schedule surgery. Let's learn some strategies on how you're going to put your shoes and socks on. If you drop something on the floor, how are you going to pick that up without bending? And that's where getting your core engaged, getting your glutes engaged so you can squat down, pick something off the floor instead of hinging at the hips. Um, that, that knowledge is really important, especially in the post-operative window. So getting that education before surgery, figuring out strategies on how you're gonna do some of the things you normally do for those first two weeks is very, very important. Very good point. Neil, any comments or Dr. Dr. El Sayed? Bending, lifting, twisting. I mean, a lot of patients ask me all the time. I have a video 
we should actually put together a video where we really explain this. I use a video that I found on YouTube that's really helpful, uh, but it is a challenge for patients. Yeah, I mean, we, we see this in some of our spinal procedures that we do, like, for example, spinal cord stimulators, where the early days are very critical to avoid movement of these wires that we spend a lot of time trying to secure and aim towards a sweet spot. Um, it's, it is important, and we actually go through some of these maneuvers of squatting down rather than bending or twisting. Um, a lot of people, when they start to feel good, start to get a little bit uh, excited and do more uh, sports activities, maybe a little early. Uh, you know, the same, same sort of concern comes up there. I personally will, will give them a, a lumbar sort of soft um, support, you know, sort of like a band. Uh, and it's not meant to actually like change something in their muscles and so forth. But the back support brace uh, just kind of reminds them to kind of avoid the major uh, bending, lifting, and twisting exercise. Yeah, I, I like those braces as well. Those those Velcro braces that you right. move around. I, I really like them. I give those out to patients. Now, these are now my two favorite slides, okay? <laughs> I'm obsessed with posture after surgery. I, I just saw a patient today, a lovely lady. She's in her 70s. She had a spinal fusion done about three months ago for spondylolisthesis and severe nerve compression. She was doing great after surgery for about four weeks. And then she started developing a lot of muscular low back pain. And, I saw, and she was very worried. She thought, oh, the screws are coming loose. Everything is falling apart. So we, she came in today. We got an x-ray. We got an MRI scan. The x-ray looks great. MRI scan looks, looks great. But then when I examined her, it was all paraspinal muscle spasms. You know, it was all muscle spasms. There was nothing really structurally wrong. And what she did, she leaned, she was leaning forward a lot. She came in with a walker and she just couldn't straight out, straighten out because of muscle spasms. So I reassured her and I had a, what I had her do in the office, I had her lean against the wall. And I do this with a lot of patients who come in a week, two weeks, three weeks after surgery. Uh, the whole point of doing these operations is sometimes to take the pressure off the nerves so people can actually straighten out. People are used with, with back issues. They're used to leaning forward, and that puts a lot of pressure on the muscles, and the muscles become really rigid and, and, and tight, and that can cause a lot of muscle pain. So after surgery, once we take the pressure off the nerves, the whole purpose is to make sure that you can straighten out your back and take the pressure off those muscles who have been tense for so long, just trying to keep you upright. But now you can do it because your nerves are decompressed. And sometimes just having patients in the office do this exercise to lean against the wall and really, and then put your hands behind your back to recreate the normal curvature of your lumbar spine. Just doing that in the office and reassuring patients can take a lot of the muscle pain away. And I tell patients sometimes, or not sometimes, all the time. Every time in New York City, it's great because everybody has an elevator and you have those 30 seconds in the elevator. So just do that. I do it myself. You lean against the wall in the elevator and you clearly try to stretch out and, and straighten out your spine. It's so good for your back muscles. And the same is true when you're sitting at a restaurant. Everybody in New York goes to restaurants. Get your little pillow, put it behind your back. So you can recreate the normal low doses of your spine, like you see here on the left side. The worst thing you can do is to crowd, you know, lean forward like this, unsupported. It puts a lot of pressure on your lower back, and your back pain is going to continue even though the surgery was successful. Now I said a lot. Any any other comments, Ricky or Nick? Yeah, no, just like what you said. If you look at these two pictures, you know the picture of the patient sitting here, and also when. Patients typically have back pain due to spinal stenosis, which is probably one of the more common things we refer for surgery. Most of those patients have gotten used to leaning forward a little bit, using a rolling walker or a cane to decompress some of the spine elements. And what happens is the hip flexor, the hip flexor gets very, very tight and shortened. So that's right at the waistline. The hip flexor muscle starts in your lower back and inserts down into your hip area. And that muscle gets tight. So you're chronically leaning forward and it's almost impossible to stand fully erect because that muscle's so tight. So in addition to the decompression surgery, 
which will help take the pressure off the nerves. Then it's a matter of really stretching out that hip flexor. Otherwise, your posture is never going to go back to where it was. So not only standing up against a wall with your heels and your shoulder blades and your neck and your head up against the wall, another great exercise is actually lying flat on your face on the floor and really forcing your butt to come towards the ground to stretch out the front of your thighs. Uh, you can do that on your bed as well if you have mobility issues, but just a great way to stretch out the front of your front of your legs. That's a good point. I just wanted to emphasize this point too, just a bit, because uh, once the hip flexor is tight, I think the sacroiliac joint is especially vulnerable after surgery too. And a lot of patients complain after surgery of SI joint pain that wasn't there before because of exactly what Dr. Singh described. The hip flexors are tight and they haven't taken the time out to uh, do these posture exercises. And then it's uh, insult to injury essentially at that point. And uh, it's avoidable and uh, it's very helpful. That's a great point. The SI joint, we had a patient today also after surgery had clear SI joint pain and that can happen. And it's a something that we can recognize, we can treat very effectively with injections, maybe an ablation if, uh, if it's necessary. And these patients do really, really well. Like you said, happens all the time, especially after surgery, but it's transient. I, I totally agree with the comment about the SI joint. It, it comes up a lot. I think it's a relatively underdiagnosed and un, under um, expected as a pain source. Uh, but the hip flexor, in my opinion, I, I suffer from the same problem. I've tied hip flexors and my SI joint had one out two summers ago and I treated the SI joint. I neglected the cause of it, which was a hip flexor. And now I'm significantly better. Uh, Dr. Hoddle, there's a question that came in from the chat about uh, minimally invasive spine surgery, probably a microdiscectomy. What, what do you tell patients about the chance of recurrence from a disc herniation? You know, we tell them what to avoid, no BLTs, but is there a window at which the chance of a recurrent disc herniation is lessened or is zero after a microsurgery? Yeah, so that brings me to my third favorite slide. So uh, there is a, you know, if you have a herniated disc in the neck or in the, in the lumbar spine and you treat this disc herniation surgically, you take the pressure off the nerve, the leg pain is going to get better. You got to imagine that there is, where that disc herniation is, there's a small opening in the annulus and the, the coverings of the disc where that disc herniation came out originally, otherwise it wouldn't be there. And that whole there's not much we can do right now surgically to really treat that hole. So there's going to be a tiny little opening and more disc material can herniate out as the patient kind of recovers. And this can happen just for no reason, bad luck, but it can also happen because you're doing the wrong things after surgery. And what are the wrong things? So anything that you can do as a patient that increases the pressure in that disc in the lower part of the back could potentially squeeze out more disc material. And this is a study here, and I'm showing you the, the visualized kind of results of this study that was done many decades ago, where they actually implanted in patients and volunteers, they implanted little sensors into the disc. They put with a needle little sensors into the disc space to measure the pressure when these, these were normal individuals, not patients. When these individuals were doing certain maneuvers, you can see here, uh, so, for example, here, when you're lying flat, then the pressure was relatively low. Uh, but if you're standing up and they're measuring the pressure in the lower part of the lumbar spine in one of the discs, the worst is when you're standing up, you're leaning forward, and then you're lifting up a heavy, heavy object. You put a lot of pressure on that disc. And you can imagine if there's a small opening in that disc, more disc material will squeeze out and you'll have a recurrent disc herniation. And that can happen at exactly the same level where you just had a successful operation. And statistically speaking, that the, the risk of this happening, a recurrent disc herniation is anywhere between 10 and 20%, maybe over the first year after surgery. It's more likely to happen in young women for some reason. It's more likely to happen if you have a very, very tall disc space. In older patients with a collapsed disc space, it's less likely to happen. Uh, and it can cause the same type of pain that you had before surgery. So patients can come back and sometimes you need more surgery. So you gotta be careful. So this is a very interesting study because it tells you, you should certainly avoid heavy lifting, bending and twisting, right? That's exactly what we're saying. And that's what the study here shows. 
uh, lying flat at night, the, the pressure on the disc is very low. Sitting, sitting with the, and, and here, look at the difference between keeping your back straight and leaning forward, even in a sitting position, there's a difference. So you, that's why when you're sitting, you should really recreate your lordosis and have uh, a pillow behind your back. Now, uh, so that's the issue of a recurrent disc herniation after surgery. Thanks for, thanks for bringing that up. Ricky, somebody wants you to repeat the laying down stretch that you just mentioned. Can you? Oh, yeah, I, I sent it. I sent it to Susan on direct message. But basically, it's a way to force your hips into extension. So you're lying on your belly, and imagine if your hip flexors were really tight, your butt would kind of be sticking in the air. So you try to lay on your stomach and let gravity force your pelvis and your bottom towards the ground and stretch out the front of your hip. Um, just doing any type of hip flexor stretching, like a lunge, anything, any of these things will mostly be helpful for a lot of patients with spine issues or sacroiliac joint issues. How do you know as a patient, you know, we refer patients to physical therapy, right? And, and we don't have a physical therapist here in the spine center. By the way, we're, we're, we're moving, you know, we're gonna move, we're gonna open a second spine center downtown in Hudson Yards towards the end of next year where there's gonna be physical therapy actually on site, which is nice. But here on the Upper East Side right now, we don't have physical therapy here in the building. So we refer patients to physical therapy outside. As a patient, how do you know that you're working with a good physical therapist? Any, any thoughts, anybody? Yeah, you know, that comes up a lot. You know, patients say, and we say that too, you know, we're, we're guilty of blaming patients for things. We say patients failed physical therapy. Patient failed an injection, patient failed surgery, right? Instead of us saying we failed the patient at doing things that we were supposed to do to help them. So a lot of times I ask patients, you know, yeah, you went to physical therapy, didn't help, but what were you doing in physical therapy? Was there one-on-one -on -one attention? Was there manual therapy? Were they doing things to you, mobilizing soft tissues, uh, different treatments, ultrasound and TENS? Or was it, and a lot of patients, unfortunately, due to the economics of healthcare, a lot of times they triple or quadruple book patients and they say, okay, you go sit on the bike, you do some resistance bands. Sometimes it's fine, but some of that one-on-one -on -one direction is really helpful. So I think it's really about getting what the patient experience was specifically, not just saying therapy didn't work, but what specifically did the patient do in therapy? So I try to get a sense of what they did and what they didn't do. Maybe they weren't working on the right muscles or some of the right modalities. Um, so I wouldn't say... I mean, therapy helps. I've gone to therapy. I know it helps. You just need the right therapist, the right attention, the right indication, um, and then graduate from therapy and do stuff on your own at home. Good approach. Any recommendations for, I mentioned pillows, right? So uh, there's a question about a special pillow. There's no real special pillow. I mean, I uh, I was on a plane the other day and the airline actually gave us I was upgraded, so I, I, I had the benefit of getting a, a pillow from the airline, and uh, I'm not going to mention which airline. I'm probably not supposed to mention that, but it was perfect. As I actually took it home afterwards because it was the perfect size. It was not too big, not too small, and you could put it right behind your back, and, uh, and it was really helpful. So I don't know, Neil or, or Dr. El Sayed or Ricky, any recommendations for pillows? You know, my my take is pillows are very much a personal choice, and and really, it's something just like mattresses, something that you're going to test out a few different types and see what works best for you. For me, uh, having tried a bunch of pillows for some minor neck pain, I settled on one. Uh, working with stores that had return policies that allowed me to try it out at home for a night or two, I think that sort of general advice goes a long way. Wow, they do that. They take the pillows back. You gotta you gotta share those stories with us. Well for the same reason we don't mention airline. <laughs> <laughs> All right, talking about neck pillows, the cell phone, right? Big, big problem. And obviously all of us are to blame, you know, and but you gotta remember, you know, the your head is very heavy 
and the neck muscles have to support it. So it's not surprising if you end up with neck pain at the end of the day, if all day you're just leaning forward, looking at your cell phone, you know, but it's worthwhile remembering that this is a real epidemic now. I mean, we see it all the time in clinic. Yeah, we, you know, we talked about this, uh, especially during COVID. I think it, it's come up even more, um, you know, text neck, you know, everyone is facing down and you'd be surprised. Uh, they did a study in uh, 2016 or 17, how many times we pick up our phone? And the answer is about 1500 times a day, 1500 times a day, we pick up our phone to look at it. And that just chronic flexion, and you can see the different weights that it puts on the cervical elements when you flex forward. Um, that's a lot of load. So it tells you how much you should be exercising to combat those flexion and gravitational forces on your neck. Uh, but it's just an important, interesting number to to realize how much you look at your phone, even when not thinking about it. Yeah. I mean, it just goes, I, I tell you, every time I'm in the elevator or I have a wall, I lean against the wall. I try to remind myself, got to keep the neck straight. You know, got to keep your neck straight. It makes a big difference. It becomes second nature. Tai Chi, huh? We've worked with Master Yang Yang for years. He's done Tai Chi classes for our patients. They're very, very successful. As a matter of fact, he did a study that some of you probably participated in where he just where he compared patients with back pain who do Tai Chi versus patients with back pain who do regular physical therapy or exercises. And the ones with Tai Chi did much, much better in terms of their back pain. It's a study that he's actually now publishing. It's going to be published in the medical literature. Yang so, Yang is uh, actually on with us uh, here. Is I he saw. really? Well, yeah. that's great. It's great to have him. And thanks for your help with our patients. Now, almost 40 minutes. I think it's time to wrap up. Do we have any burning questions? Any recommendations sleeping on an incline or flat? Any recommendations? You know, we, we've talked about this before when we did our webinar on uh, pillows and mattresses. And really the answer to that question is just like what Dr. Matha said was a lot of times, most of these companies where you can buy pillows and mattresses online, give you a 30 day, 60 day, six month, even sometimes a year in home trial to really figure out what suits your body. So the answer to, you know, sleeping incline or flat or on your side or on your stomach all really relates to what makes you comfortable, what allows you to be refreshed in the morning. You know, we say it's very rare that your sleeping posture is the reason why you have back pain. It's really all the stuff you're not doing during the day or doing during the day that's really causing most of your spine issues. So focus on what you can modify, work on posture, work on exercise, work on weight loss. You know, every pound of weight extra is seven to 10 pounds on your spine. So losing five to 10 pounds is really gonna have a positive impact. And yes, the mattresses and pillows can help, but that's not the cause. Just focus on things you do during, during when you're running around in life and less so on uh, the passive modalities of your mattress and pillow. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think uh, exercise and healthy exercise, I think is really, and nutrition, right? Uh, we discussed that also, sleeping, healthy exercise, nutrition. I mean, it goes so far uh, and uh, can really help you not only having a better back, but also just a better life in general. Now, this is our last slide of our last Spine Time webinar for a little while. We're going to take a break. We're going to be back for sure. Uh, but uh, at this point, you know, we've done more than 70, I guess, 70 webinars, 70 Spine Time webinars. The first one was in the middle of COVID in June of 2020. At that time, it was really a... Um, an opportunity for us to kind of come back together, talk to each other, and really do what we love the most, namely deal with our patients, communicate with our patients, and hopefully provide helpful, helpful information and advice for patients to, first of all, avoid surgery, but also overcome their spine issues. And I think from what I've heard over the years, patients really love this. And uh, we're, we're sorry that we're going to take a break, but we have to, it, 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 believe it or not, but there's a tremendous amount of organizational work involved in putting this together, you know, getting the faculty, arranging the faculty, making sure everybody's available, 
uh, on a particular date coming up with the topics. And we've got a fantastic team in neurosurgery with Roseanne uh, Henry here and Jessica Bloom, who've been who have been doing this now for several years in a, a really wonderful way and in a way that really kept us all together and kept the patients engaged. I want to thank Roseanne and Jessica and the team behind the scenes here. We have a fellow, a research fellow, Blake, who's been helping us as well, and before him, others. I want to thank all of those individuals really for making this possible. Yes, Don't cheers, a, cheers to them. Thank you. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. And again, this is going to be a break. If um, uh, however, that that said, if anybody here of the listeners, patients or not patients, if you have particular uh, ideas about you know what we can discuss in the future, please share that with us, of course, and we'll keep you posted. Hopefully, in January, we'll we'll restart our series of webinars. And until then, I want to thank everybody. Be healthy. Protect your back. Neil, any final, you know, the co-directors, any final thoughts? No, we've really thoroughly enjoyed this experience. And, uh, you know, we couldn't have made it successful without your interaction and your enthusiasm to, to attend and participate and actively ask questions. So uh, thank you to, to that. And uh, we hope that you'll take the time to re-look at some of our old archived uh, webinars to help spread the word to other people. And we remain available to you here in our, our Center for Comprehensive Spine Care. Yeah, absolutely. It's been, it's been a nice uh, three years. You know, we do a lot of lectures at our medical conferences, but having one that's patient facing where we can directly engage with you guys, I mean, the patients and the listeners to the webinar are really wide successful. So we appreciate you guys taking the time out of your schedules to be part of this. Um, and hopefully we will see you guys soon. Yeah, so thanks, thanks a lot, everyone. And again, special thanks to Roseanne and Jessica. Did we ever see you, Roseanne? You want to show your face at the end of Spine Time? Maybe, maybe not. But uh, we'll uh, <laughs> we'll uh, we'll stay in touch. We'll send you emails, and we'll see you in clinic. And uh, thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Enjoy good night. your. Day.